Hey everyone, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Executive Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that vinegar can kill tuberculosis and mycobacteria even better than bleach. Researchers found that the active ingredient in vinegar, which is called acetic acid, outperforms chlorine bleach, which itself can be toxic. Using a supermarket grade 6% solution for 30 minutes wiped out even the most drug resistant mycobacterium tuberculosis which means hmm, maybe vinegar is useful for something besides tasting good. Today's guest on the show is someone I'm fortunate to be talking with. It's Dr. Richie Shoemaker. Richie Shoemaker changed my life because he wrote a book called Mold Warriors a while back. If you've been listening for a while, you know I had Lyme disease, and you know I've been exposed to toxic molds, and you know I'm a bit of a canary. It was... Dr. Shoemaker's explanation of complex inflammatory pathways in the gut, along with some treatment modalities that led me in part to recover a lot of my health. So the knowledge that Dr. Shoemaker has has put together through working with biotoxin illnesses throughout his career is impressive and almost shocking when you hear about all the work he's done. So Dr. Shoemaker... Uh, your most recent book is, is Surviving Mold. It's also a profoundly good book, even for those who are not sick with mold today, just about how to build a house that's appropriate. Thank you for coming on the show. It, it is an honor to have you. Well, thank you for your kind words. It's a pleasure to to see you on Skype, and I've I've heard of you, and this this is going to be fun. We, we We've got a lot of good energy to share today. I think so. All right. You've written several books on mold. And tell me about Surviving Mold, the most recent one. What motivated you to write it? I had so much that I had learned since I published Mold Warriors in 2005. And there were so many pieces of the puzzle that were left out that it was pretty clear that it was time to, to try to put uh, some, well, some, some, some time into expanding careful attention to detail on remediation and looking more carefully at how, uh, in, in my mind, the U.S. agencies have kind of let us down as far as proper evaluation of sick people uh, inside water damaged buildings. And uh, it, was, it was time to really say what the status of, of, of treatment was. In 2010, when I published Surviving Mold, we were just getting started with a paper on use, for example, of vasoactive intestinal polypeptide, or VIP. And since that, that book was published, we now have 18-month follow-up on our VIP cohort. We, we picked the worst folks, quite frankly, Dave, as well as you're doing. You, you wouldn't have qualified for the study. Maybe when you were initially ill, you would have. But yeah. nonetheless, um, with VIP, we had two questions. Does the drug work? long term and is it safe long term i guess that's four questions but the answer to to all of those questions was yes it does and we were able to show rather phenomenal safety and we found some problems with vip that you can't use it for this and you can't use it for that if you have pre-existing conditions of different kinds but if you've met all the criteria vip truly was just what the doctor ordered and when surviving mold came out it was like this looks pretty good and now where we are is, geez, how can we let people walk around without regulation of inflammation uh, from, from things like VIP? And we're using VIP in some hands with docs that are, that are not retired, quite frankly, to overcome some additional obstacles. And we're looking at those to create uh, races of supermen in the sense that <laughs> you can, no, no kidding. You, yeah. can, you can improve exercise tolerance. You can improve cognition. It is genomically active. And yeah. Dave, boy, that's another talk for another day. The real issue is that we can look at fingerprints of what inflammation is doing, not just in your brain, we talked about before the show, but also in human gene expression. So Mold Warriors was a, was a good start, I thought. My mom liked it. My grandmother liked it and all that. But <laughs> Surviving Mold, my wife uh, just says, look, do not write another 500-page paper or book. And I said, okay, I didn't. It's 800 pages. So, <laughs> so Mold and Peace is what we call that one. But the, the, the next book is, is getting ready to come out maybe this, this coming year. And it's going to be looking back as, you know, now that I've looked death in the face for my own illnesses from mold, 
uh, and, and that fortunately has left me alone for a bit, what, where, where do we go from here? And where we go from here is inside the human genome. Yes. What percentage of people are particularly sensitive to mold in your experience as a 30-year practicing physician focusing on mold and other environmental illness? We have collected statistics on over 10,000 cases and 2,000 controls, and we've looked at the genetic makeup that these folks have. The immune response genes, or HLADR, is a series of, of, of areas on chromosome 6 that are understudied, but remarkable in what they're doing as far as taking a foreign particle uh, an antigen and processing it so that our immune response can make an antibody to it. And in this group of HLA-DR, we see consistently 24, 25% of people cannot make adequate antibody responses. And they're the ones that comprise over 95% of people who have an illness from water damaged buildings. Now, you're going to say, well, geez, 95 is not 100. Biology is not 100%. You can get sick without HLA susceptibility. But genetics is huge. So here you are, a young man. I'm going to be saying to you, we know that you're better, but you were ill. What's your HLA? And then what's the HLA of your kids? And in my experience, being the one in four who gets completely whacked upside the head by a moldy environment, one you don't know you're in the first time, especially. It's like All of a sudden, life falls apart. I remember going to the doctor and saying, I feel like I've been poisoned. Like nothing works. I, I Like I'm wrecked. And... The other people, though, they go into these moldy environments, they mount an immune response, but it comes at biological cost, and it comes out of their cognitive function first, and then maybe they just get a cold. But they get a response that isn't free, and none of us are healthier from being in moldy environments. Some of us are more resilient than others, but by removing this from our environment, you free up resources to do something else useful with life. And that's, that's part that's, of the whole bulletproof thing. That's absolutely uh, important information when people have some minor so-called minor symptoms with acute exposure that resolve with removal uh, we might say well you had an allergy right uh, or you had this or that but basically what you had was this, this your idea of, of, of being bulletproof uh, is that you were shot and hit yeah. Now, granted, you were hit in, in, in some sort of Kevlar vest, so you're only knocked down on the ground, you got up, and you're not dead. Right. But <laughs> you but still, you're got still were hit. Yeah. Oh, that's perfectly said, and, and that's the right image there. So when I, I work with people who don't have those genes, or at least don't appear to, because they can go into places that would really give me a full, my forehead swells up, and I feel like crap when I go in there, and I go through a detox protocol. Uh, they still don't do as well, but they just, oh, I've got a headache and you know I got a sore throat, but I'm fine the next week. And, and they're back in the saddle without taking activated charcoal or anything else. Uh, so, okay, so we're talking about breathing mold and damaged buildings and genetics. And so one in four people are at serious risk and the rest of us have various degrees of performance decline that happens in the presence of this. What about food molds? In litigation, one of the common ploys of defense interest trying to say the apartment that was not taken care of properly and the, the, the mold on the shoes and the mold in the kitchen and the mold in the closet, well, that, that's not the problem. Yes, there was an illness, but it was, it was all from eating mold. <laughs> and, and, and you had uh, an esteemed group of... Uh, of practitioners set up their own college. It's not a board. But the American College of Occupational Environmental Medicine said, you know, no, mycotoxins need to come to a certain level to make people sick. And we all snicker, 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 saying what a bunch of garbage that is. But then they say, but because you never get that level, the illness comes from ingestion. So that became one of the ploys that I had to refute Mm -hmm. as an expert in mold litigation. And, and fortunately, there's a tremendous amount of really exciting information uh, still coming out. The USDA is looking fairly hard uh, at mycotoxins in animal feeds. And <laughs> yes. Yeah, sure. And, and, and <laughs> you know, if it's an agency, there's going to be a cover-up. Oh, I didn't say that. But specifically, <laughs> if there's an agency opinion it's possible that there is an unspoken agenda is what this really mean. 
how much pork makes you sick, we should do that. But then also along the same way, what can we measure within 15 minutes? The, the classic example of Hyperacute uh, changes comes with measuring transforming growth factor beta-1, TGF beta-1, one of my favorites. Oh, what an important <laughs> compound. But when we want to see if a guy is going to tolerate VIP or not, we'll measure his labs at baseline, give him a single dose of VIP, and then track symptom changes, which usually will occur at 5 and 10 minutes, and repeat the blood analysis in 15 minutes. And if TGF beta-1 goes up, Guess what? That person's coming from a moldy environment. And they're going to say, oh, no, no, couldn't be, couldn't be. But it certainly is. So if we take your pork experiments and add to that one that has been shown to work, I think it would be doable uh, even before the, the genomics comes out on the market. Wow. So it's, it's, worth, it's worth thinking about. I, I would pay for my own studies for that sort of thing, uh, to have that done just to sort of show it's N equals 1. But... The whole point behind quantified self and citizen science is that N equals one is pretty damn valid if you're that one and that it probably is useful information for others and they can do their own N equals one. And at a certain point, we have enough data. Uh, there is, for instance, in the pork case, there's epidemiological data from different countries, a lot of Eastern Europe around the level of this toxin in pork and the incidence of particularly kidney and bladder problems. And we understand some weird things about how that toxin smooths out the inner wall of the mitochondria. So you get mitochondrial damage from mold, which is separate from the VIP to leptin to insulin resistance kind of pathway that builds up. And honestly, I think that's one of the reasons I weighed 300 pounds was because I was living in a house that had mold in it. And it's, uh, it, it's a fascinating environment uh, to look at because this is all sort of hidden. Number one, you don't know you're in a moldy environment unless you've become sensitized, like I certainly have been and a lot of your patients have been. And if you're having symptoms that happen a day or a week later, like, like for me, the, uh, the way it feels, and in fact, I'd love to get the medical explanation of this. I was on a, a dinner cruise in San Diego and the, the ship smelled like a mop. I knew it had mold in it, but I wanted to spend some time with the people there. So I said, all right, I'm going to take a hit. And I forgot my glutathione and my charcoal because I do well when I take those if I'm exposed to mold. And I just didn't have them with me on the trip. So I came out of there the next day, four times I forgot a word. What was I going to say? I don't ever drop words. My brain works all the time. And I noted that because it was weird. The day after that, I started getting really tired and my GI stopped working. Like all sorts of bad problems that I'm not used to ever having anymore. The day after that, I started getting skin lesions like deep pimples and things like that, getting... Uh, canker sores in my mouth and then I needed to sleep 12 hours and I just felt like garbage until I took cholestyramine and activated charcoal and lots of calcium deglucarate and lots of other things so I know my response curve I, I first it's brain then it's gut then it's skin and when I grew love handles the next day in fact I posted a picture I grew breasts literally I had swelling in my breasts uh you could like see my nipples in pictures that looked weird What's going on from an inflammation perspective, given I'm an acute example, but subtle levels of this happen in other people as well? What's the, what, what's the etiology of that? One of the really important issues is change in cell membrane permeability. We know that with NeuroQuant, which is done in California, not too far north of, of San Diego, that we can look at changes in some structures of the brain where they develop microscopic interstitial edema, a long way of saying that you can't see this swelling of a brain area uh, with an MRI, which is macroscopic. So this is microscopic, but the swelling is between the cells. So you have increasing leakiness of the blood-brain barrier. Fluid and plasma particulates will move into particular areas. So you can sum as a whole enlargement of, an, of a, say, forebrain parenchyma or cortical gray, something like that, in, in the part of the brain. But that's happening on a microscopic basis. Now, the changes hyperacutely in brain clearly are due to blood-brain barrier permeability changes. Uh, VEGF, MMP9, TGF beta-1, really good literature to support that. And that's one reason that we measure those. And it's kind of interesting that, that we also know that TGF beta-1 induces production of compounds that block correction of brain damage after the fact. 
so that if you have traumatic brain injury, if you've got concussions and all this stuff, you start making a stuff called glial fibrillary acidic protein. The name doesn't matter. But specifically, that stops the reassessment of interaction of these fibers called Purkinje fibers in the brain. So not only is there an acute injury, but that acute injury is multiplied by a genomic change. In the gut, much quicker. I, I thought that you were going to say that your gut was coming before your brain. I, I feel it in the gut first, but I don't get okay. the, the lack. I don't get like bad gas and diarrhea and all that. I just feel my stomach's like you ate something bad. Like like, like I know, but there isn't like any external sign. <laughs> Some of the best work done at at this so-called leaky gut has come out of the celiac groups yeah. that look at tight junctions. The same tight junctions that are part in the blood-brain barrier are paralleled by uh, analogous, but not exactly the same structures in the gut. And those are loosened rapidly, especially if you're low in melanocyte stimulating hormone or MSH. So that if your MSH is, is cooked, and most folks that I see are, specifically your predisposition to develop hyperacute changes in GI is is multiplied. Added to that is the tremendous increase in bile salt production hyperacutely. This is one of the things that we see as as bile flow is slowed by an inflammatory response. The bile salt production gets upregulated in an attempt to move bile along. That doesn't work, and you get sludging of bile, and then a reflux of bile back into the stomach and get lots of misdiagnoses of what's wrong with abdominal pain and bloating and belching. But specifically, as those bile salts move down further in the gut, they can add synergistically to loosening of some of these tight junctions in jejunum and ileum. So it's it's oh. not just one element. Now you, you mentioned the pigs and, and I want to go back to the confounders. You know full well that in a moldy building you've got bacteria, you've got oh, yeah. actinomycetes. Well, you get all this stuff. Well, show me a good animal factory, like a hog factory or a pig factory, that doesn't have some kind of lagoon around full of particular kind of nutrients. Yeah, and guess yeah. what grows there? Cyanobacteria. Now, huge problem in North Carolina where pigs and, and chickens both are, have these type of problems is many of these lagoons are full of now cylindrospermopsis and microcystis, and that adds to the inhalation of pigs and hogs of what's growing out in the lagoon. Now, people who aren't familiar with your work, most of the people listening to this probably aren't, um, should know that you got started being an amazing medical detective looking at what happens with these toxic blooms of algae and how they create chronic neurotoxins that survive and can enter the water supply and have killed people by causing this sort of inflammation. And that this is how you got down the chronic neurotoxin, down the biotoxin path. So you're saying that that original work now is illuminating what's happening at industrial animal farms where sure. they're allowing this to happen and it is airborne, correct? Yes, indeed. You know, the, air, the, the particular cyanobacterial toxins will be volatilized in association with water droplets. So they're not evaporating, but they are in the air. You can breathe the air over the body of water. The wind can blow it. Some of the classic examples in Florida and Lake Apopka were people having measurable amount of microcystin uh, in six-floor condominiums 200 yards and 50 yards away from the shore of the lake. And it's like, how did this get here? We had the same problem with a guy in, in Wisconsin. You say, well, Wisconsin's a hotbed for microcystis. Sure, it's 50 degrees below zero there now. Well, actually, in front, in between, between this guy's apartment in, 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 in Lake Michigan, he's outside Milwaukee, uh, he has this beautiful lagoon full of blue greens. And, you know, then here you are in California with, with people, you know, eating blue green algae for, for, to, for health benefits out of Klamath Lake. Now, like Klamath Lake had a big outbreak of microcystis. It's like, wait a minute, you know, this just doesn't make a lot of sense. So as you go forward, I would love, since we can measure microcystin in blood, I would love to give you some summer pork and some spring pork and start to try to measure some of these things in addition to the proteomics. 
that would be fascinating and I'd be happy to be a guinea pig and I know how to get myself back in the saddle within two days even if I eat the world's worst pork <laughs> but I'll cool. pay for it <laughs> cool so I, wow <laughs> I thought I thought you were going to tell me that chicken was also doing the things because one thing that I just don't that, eat that, chicken it's gross and it's full of bad fusarium from the corn like chicken's just not a good a good source of polyunsaturated fats either so I, I just don't think it's on it's on the optimized human diet well, it's 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 even worse than what you said. Uh oh. <laughs> one of the one of the problems with little baby chickens and little baby pigs both is that they suffer from a parasite, not a babesia, not a toxoplasma, but another one of these AP complexans of the malaria family that's called Imeria. Cool. And E I M E R I A. And Imeria kills little chicks like crazy. And granted they're only ten cents a piece, but boy, that adds up if you got forty thousand little chickens and ten cents times ten cents. What do they do? They put in monensin and nigericin, which are polycyclic ether toxins, into chicken feed to make sure that you kill the Imeria parasite before it starts growing in the baby chicken. And what these compounds do is that they, in association with receptors that will pick up mycotoxins, are phagocytose or engulfed into antigen-presenting cells, and monensin and nigericin same with, with insulin receptors that are internalized, will prevent release or opening of what's this, this endosome, as we call it, this little little goodie that comes in the antigen-presenting cell that you need to stick an HLA molecule on to recognize. They will prevent that release. And so if you are wondering about where your type 2 diabetes came from out of the blue, my question is, did you listen to all those people who said eat more chicken and less beef? Because <laughs> now, now you're eating monensin and nigericin, which will create insulin resistance because you sequester insulin receptors and insulin inside antigen-presenting cells. And the same thing happens with mycotoxins. And in fact, monensin is one of the things that protects against some mycotoxin poisoning if you are eating that at the same time you're eating stockpiled foods. So it, 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 it's, it's interesting. The, the, the rounder you go, the faster you get. Uh, you keep on wow. seeing more links. And what other compounds are in these foods we don't know about? Can you tell me where all the strontium is coming from in the Pokemon River? And what, what are we doing with arsenic, uh, saying that is a growth stimulant? It's, it used to be put in chicken feed all the time, and finally it's being taken out. But wh what is this stuff doing getting in the chicken that we eat? It is not something that I prefer to put in my body, and I decided a long time ago, when I go out to eat, if it's not grass-fed, pastured-fed stuff by usually small farms, I will eat a vegetarian, soy-free, corn-free, grain-free meal. Grain -free meal. In other words, I bring my own butter, and I put it on top of a whole bunch of steamed vegetables. And maybe if I'm feeling like I want carbs, I'll have some white rice, which has had the outer layer of it polished off where more of the mold toxins form. Not to mention the naturally occurring toxins that occur in the, the, layer, the outer layer of the brown rice anyway. So it sounds like I'm totally a nut, except there's thousands of people who are as picky as I am now because they tried it once and their skin cleared up and they lost weight. They stopped being inflamed. Their brain cleared up and they're just dialed in. And then there's a bunch of other people who tried it and they just felt really good all the time instead of fe feeling highly variable. So I, I think this is a much bigger problem in the food supply than anyone talks about. I mean, am, am I just being picky here or it sounds like you're kind of on the same, the same path. The issue that I face is that we need data. Yeah. And, you know, if your N equals 1 study is added to another N equals 1 study, then let's, let's get N equals 100. And there are mechanisms to do that, but we really do need to follow the principles of science. Yep. So it's one thing for you to, with 101 podcast now to share what you know, but I'm going to make the pitch that what you know needs to be looked at as, as carefully as anything else. Yes. Otherwise, you're going to be just some kind of wacko spouting off on, on the radio. But if instead you are a prophet, and I suspect you are, then what we really could do without too much trouble is develop a research design, find some funding, it shouldn't be too expensive, and actually look at this. How, now, how, much, how much funding would something like that cost? I don't know. I've never done anything like that. If we 
did this right, I would imagine that $25,000 would do a study that would be enough to show evidence that there is a problem. So it's it's mm. not zero, but it's, you know, that's what people donating their time, just, just paying for, for labs and, and, and supplies and all this. The answer is going to come from genomics. And if you, we had a pilot study that said, yes, I showed these hyperacute changes in people who have exposures, then we want to look at chronic low-level exposures, people that eat chicken all the time, people that eat pork all the time, people that think they're, they're getting older and that's why they can't remember what, where they left their hat yesterday. Um, you know, that's when the genomics will tell us what their fingerprints are. Out of 25,000 genes, for example, we've got 350 in the fingerprint for mold, and I can tell you with one tube of blood whether you're moldy or not. Same thing with, with the Neuroquan. Okay. We, can look, we can look at your brain the same way. But if we, we put all of these together, now we've got these interacting, disparate, independent variables with one conclusion. And that's the food did it. All right. I will work on ways of putting something like that together. I, I think there's probably enough demand to do like a Kickstarter or something where we get enough people who are interested to contribute a little bit and do a study because I have zero doubt that this is a problem. I've seen it in in pro athletes, people who aren't moldy sensitive, but they're just off their game, right? It's it's smaller changes, and so I'm 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 on board with it. We'll, we'll figure out how to make something like that work. It's called a proof of concept study, mm -hmm. uh, and and as such. It's not going to be double-blinded placebo control. It's not going to be uh, anything other than one data set from one group that we compare to known controls. We've already got the data on controls. We don't have to reinvent that wheel. That's a hugely important wheel. So much of what I see in, in a lot written about mold now just does not have any control groups at all. And golly, you can't do anything about conclusions without control groups. But we've already got them. So if your ideas are solid, and let's assume for a minute they are, then we can show unequivocal objective parameters and not just that I had trouble finding a word four times on Sunday. Yeah, yeah there's no doubt that science backs this up uh, in my mind. And if it doesn't, then there's something else going on. And what I would do there is I'd say, all right, let's look at the gut. Like, what's the gut biome look like? What are the bacteria that are growing in your stomach, and how do those interact? And I've read lots of research about how those break down certain mycotoxins. So there may be sure, another another sure. set of data we need there, but the effect is there for me and for enough other people that at this point, with the amount of specificity from the people I've talked with, I don't think it could be placebo just because people, they're, they're doing great, and then one day they're like, what the heck just happened? And then they trace it back to, you know, they, they did something that obviously would have introduced a mold, and they were, you know, they, they were down for only a half hour. But still, it was a half hour of fogginess that they weren't used to. So one of the things that I'm hoping that you'll do as you consider this is looking at changes in gut bacteria. Oh, if yeah. we are looking at bacteria and fungi and any number of kinds of compounds that will uh, break down mycotoxins in the gut, uh, people like Jeremy Nichols, Nicholson, this is BioMC. Yeah, Ubiome. Uh, okay. Ubiome is it's one of the genetic studies of the gut. I, I've been working with the Ubiome guys. Uh, anyway, didn't mean to interrupt your discussion there, but... Jeremy Nicholson in the UK has been one of the pioneers looking at what he calls metabolomics and other people call other things metabolomics, but specifically he's looking at metabolites in present in urine that do change fairly hyperacutely as well. So maybe some of that 25,000 we can spend on urine specimens and Jeremy can help us out. It would not be surprising if that turned out to be easy, quick, and reliable. Well, let's, let's talk for a minute going back to celiac. One of the things that toxic molds can do is they can cause your immune system to uh, cross-react with gluten and casein. So when you're exposed to the molds, you become, especially airborne molds, you become more sensitive to gluten and casein. And we know in people with Crohn's disease that there's a much higher likelihood of them having circulating aflatoxin in their blood. Do you think that there is a correlation between celiac, Crohn's, IBD, and mold toxins? If we asked the question a different way okay. and said, is there a chronic inflammatory response syndrome that can be applied to food tolerances or not, the answer is yes. 
Now, the food protein uh, induced enterocolitis, the FPIEC, is clearly shown to be some of the most in food intolerant people, whether it's corn or soy or casein or lactose. And some of these kids are just wiped out, can't eat much of anything. They're nursing only. Uh, mom, if, if mama has a fig newton, you know, the kid suffers terribly, for example. But specifically, that is related to an inflammatory process associated with exposure to water damaged buildings. We have a nice case series along that way. Crohn's is a little different in that it is a chronic inflammatory response syndrome without the same contribution with C4A and MMP9. There we see TGF beta 1 and then T regulatory cell and, and TGF beta 1 imbalances dominating those people. That's a separate issue that we know it's inflammatory, but we can't necessarily blame the initiator as exposure to a water damaged building. So there's two different issues along that way. Now, I want to just throw out for discussion the three different ways to get gluten problems. One is with true, you know, TTG, IgA positive, celiac disease. The second is MSH deficiency. MSH yeah, and there's a nice paper from James Lipton and Anna Catania looking at an MSH resident sites in the gut, and it's everywhere. When you don't have MSH, regulation of autoimmunity and autoimmune problems in the gut starts to fail tremendously, and you will see loosening of these tight junctions and actually gluten now localizing in the tight junctions where before they didn't. The third group of people I haven't figured out, and I, I appreciate your comments on this regard, they just can't handle gluten at all. They don't have anagliadin antibodies that the MSH deficient people will have. They don't have TTG antibodies. But if you give them gluten, they just they go to hell in a handbasket. So the real issue for them is, I'm sorry, medical science doesn't have the answer of why, but for now, you're, you're stuck and you can't have it. it. Could it be a gluteomorphin effect? Just the opiate effect that comes from improperly broken down gluten going into the brain, they feel like crap? Reasonable question. Uh, I don't think anybody has, has even looked at that uh, as far as the effect of any gluten compounds in the brain. Uh, if there is published data on that, it's not something I've read. Of course, that doesn't oh. mean too much. <laughs> I, there, I believe there is some on that. In fact, I, I reference it uh, probably in my Better Baby book, uh, I, if memory serves, it's there. And, and I'm also, I'm giving a talk at the Autism One conference coming up here, which is a conference for parents of autistic kids, um, where I'll be talking in part about mold and toxins and things like that, uh, and my own experiences. Uh, so I, uh, in the, the people I've worked with, also Dr. Tom O'Brien, who put on the Gluten-Free Summit, has spent years looking at autoimmune responses to gluten, just a, a total genius of a guy. Uh, we've also had some conversations both about mold cross-reactivity with gluten as well as uh, that opiate effect of it. Uh, so I, I, I'm certain given that, that those two, from those two sources, that, that there are valid studies. I'm pretty sure I've read one too, but it, it's, it's foggy. So I would, I would, I would love to okay. learn. You know, there, there are so many holes in, in my knowledge that when I listen to smart people tell me things I've never heard of, the answer is, you know, feed me, Seymour. Uh, let, <laughs> let, 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 let me learn a little bit more here because, you know, I, I've been stuck in my own little little niche of the world for, for so long uh, and still haven't got that thing figured out right so that if, we, if you ask someone like me, to comment about something I don't know about, I'm not going to be of any help yeah. to you. But if you take a study that's a proof of concept study and you put two things in and neither one is known to be related, you're going to lose in any credibility of that study. So pick one and follow through with it. Uh, the autism uh, group of people, I don't think that mold is, is causative, having seen a small number of autistic kids, maybe 100 or so. But I know full well but if you take an autistic kid and you make a moldy, you sure make his autism worse. So inflammation is not a friend of the autistic person. I, I believe that there's chronic autoimmune inflammation in autism, and it's hard to know exactly what it is that pushes the immune system over, and that sometimes it may be mold, sometimes it may be mercury, sometimes it may be some other stressors. But it, it something happens that pushes you over, and it's usually a cumulative burden. So I wouldn't say mold is causative. I think in some cases, particularly one in Huntington Beach, it, it, sure, it sure looks like it. Even a court said it was causative. Um, 
but it's it's one of those things where it's certainly not beneficial for anyone on the planet, <laughs> and it's much more harmful to some than others, uh, which is you know, one of the reasons I focus on that in my work. Now, let's switch gears a bit, and let's talk about things like wheat, corn, soy, or dare I say coffee. Uh, what's the mycotoxin risk in your experience? Like, like, What's the potential health impact of people eating these things that sit around and do spoil during transport, storage, during growth? Uh, what? How important is it? We have looked at aflatoxin as as our target, and have not looked at stored wheat or stored corn or stored coffee. So I, I, I'm somewhat at a loss to answer okay. that with any data. But in in uh, in answer to one uh, criticism of of my ideas in in deposition, I had. Some 10 people that were really good folks and, and willing to go along with a wacko idea who I asked to eat as much peanut butter uh, <laughs> in a day as they could. Ugh. And, you know, on average, it, it was about six pounds of peanut butter per person. Wow. So and this was this was good Skippy chunk and maybe someone's a GIF fan or something <laughs> else, but uh, I had Skippy. Uh, and we looked for evidence of aflatoxin poisoning despite FDA regulations and rules and, and limits. And we found no change in any of the markers that I could look at in blood. Now, that was not proteomics. It was a limited number of, 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 of testing. It certainly was not genomics. But the whole issue is that in all of these ideas that, that you have, whether it's, it's coffee, whether it's, it's this or that, any assessment we've got has got to include your friend glutathione. Glutathione deficiency, I think, is is overstated. Um, David Perlmutter called me the other day. He's getting ready to retire and wants to do some phone consults like I do, and he wants to do some teaching. And what what's what's it like not seeing patients? Well, you're going to miss patient care like crazy. But he's in my mind is the father of glutathione data. You know that great study he did injected the guy with Parkinson's, and for 45 mm -hmm. minutes, you know he was fine. Uh, and, and Rich Van Kenienberg for the longest time wanted to everybody be on glutathione, this, that, and the other. And then there are some docs that, that swear by glutathione. And yet when we look at the effect of glutathione supplementation, whether it's by injection, whether it's by tablet, whether it's underneath the tongue, and try to show measurable changes in proteomics, it isn't there. Pro glutathione is cited repeatedly as contributing to breakdown of mycotoxins in gut and duodenum. So can, can I refute that? No. So mycotoxins might be there, but do they get out of the stomach? And with patulin, we know that a very small percentage will. And if they get out of the stomach, if they get bound to a receptor that binds onto a free acetyl group, if they are engulfed by an alveolar macrophage, for example, or an antigen-presenting cell, and monensin's around, that mycotoxin will go into the side of the cell, and the cell will die. This idea of program autophagy is one of the cell basically killing itself, or apoptosis goes along with that, but basically looking at consumption of the organelles of a cell as a defense mechanism because some cells will take things we can't metabolize and can't process, suck them in, and then the cell gets chewed up. So that becomes the mechanism to destroy things. Uh, in A U T O P H A G Y. Yeah. Autophagy is, is an important concept. And we use intermittent but, fasting on the bulletproof thing in order to increase autophagy and uh, protein fasting once a week. So, definitely. Okay. But you know, along with that, w I don't know what, what microbes in the gut are going to break down mycotoxins. Because, face it, these are energy rich compounds. They're carboxylic acid ethers with lots of oxygen, lots of energy tied up in double bonds. Man, this is fertilizer for somebody. Yeah. And uh, I don't have it in the front of my brain, but I've seen the studies on which species break down different different mycotoxins. And it's all a question of you know where in the gut, where are they absorbed. It's complex. I don't think we have all the answers there. And the, the comments about glutathione are, are really interesting. I know for for cognitive function purposes, I feel a noticeable difference on glutathione. I make a, a liposomal glutathione with a lactoferrin 
molecule in it as well. So it absorbs through the gut lining um, using actually the same mechanism that uh, one of the pharmaceutical companies uses for delivering large drugs into the bloodstream. So it's a, a extreme bioavailability version of it. And when I've been exposed to a moldy indoor environment, less so from just food, taking a like five doses of it, um, for me, makes it, it makes my brain feel better. Like I, I can start thinking again relatively quickly versus when I don't take it. But I also separately from it, but I take charcoal, I take cholestyramine, uh, I take a, a bunch of anti-inflammatory stuff, and I basically knock the inflammation down in every pathway I know of, and I increase glucarnation with calcium deglucarate. If you have <laughs> one change that you've made, mm-hmm. you've got a stable program, and you know that this uh, nifty liposome is that you make is reliable and all that that one is an even quicker and less expensive proof of concept study to do and for all the i call them environmental docs that that love uh glutathione i was i keep on saying where's the data where's the data bill ray had some data he had multiple variables thrown at the same time and if you don't control for multiple variables simultaneously what do you have nothing Hmm. And Bill Ray's stuff works for some of the worst patients I've ever seen. And it's so a glutathione I, 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 thing? thing? He has glutathione, okay, okay, he has okay. saunas, he has uh, allergy treatments that he makes up. I mean, he's a really bright guy. But at the same time, if someone like me comes along is not as bright as he is and says, I'm going to try this too, can I reproduce what he does if I don't have something written down in a cookbook? And that's the whole idea of having protocols, yeah. which is where I come in to say, Look at you, you've got individual variation up the wazoo on what you're doing, and how do we know that that liposome is making the difference if you've done four interventions at the same time? But there's, there's, there's answers, and it's your enthusiasm and your youth that will contribute to getting these kinds of answers out there. The, the idea of citizen science, the N equals one, thing comes into play here and there's the the single variable testing it's really important but what i've discovered in terms of you know, losing 100 pounds and turning my brain back on and becoming way healthier than i've been in, at any time in my life even though i'm i'm over 40 is that you're not going to bake a loaf of bread by baking the yeast then baking the water then baking the flour You've got to mix stuff together in a complex system in order to create a result. So what I tend to do for something like inflammation is I put everything in that I can think of. And then I pull single variables out to see if it stops working. Because if there's five things causing inflammation and you pull out this one, no change. And you pull out this one, no change. You don't, you oftentimes won't see it. For instance, you're allergic to casein and you're allergic to gluten. If you pull just one of them out of your diet, you're probably not going to see significant results at all if you pull them both out at the same time all of a sudden everything changes so the the complex interaction of our gut biome the external the exposome all the mold and other things were were tied to and all makes eliminating single variables easier than introducing single variables at least for getting rapid results any comments on that approach in 2004, at the beginning of the chronic fatigue meetings uh, that were held in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, I gave the first talk of the morning and said, whatever you do, do one, one intervention at a time. <laughs> Record data and, and be very precise. Jacob Teitelbaum gets up after me and he said, Richie's science is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But my patients want to feel better, so I do everything all at once. And, you know, there's, there still is, is, is no clear... Uh, assessment of, you know, is Jacob right or am I right? But if what Jacob is going to do is going to be sent to many people with heterogeneity of genomics, heterogeneity of genetics, heterogeneity of inflammatory responses, he's going to find that some people get better, some people get worse, and some people have no change. But he's not going to know any one of those three. Now, your idea is a variation of that which is to remove one at a time. For example, it's very common for people that I see who like supplements to take 20 different kinds of supplements at a time. And they'll have this, that, and the other. And I say, okay, uh, do you know that your silymarin is actually helping? Well, I don't know of any difference. I said, have you stopped it to see if you felt worse? And they say, no. <laughs> That's I, a problem. <laughs> I've, I've, I've been told to take it. 
But if you say, say, okay, let's get some of the inflammation cleared up and then take your supplements one at a time and remove them and to do this basically repetitive re-exposure trial. We're going to take you off it. Do you get worse? And if so, we'll put you back on it. Do you get better? Yeah. And similarly, if we take you off something and you get better, then do we give it back to you and do you get worse? So you're doing uh, with foodstuffs, for example, uh, taking away casein and putting back casein and see if they get better. There are different variations of the same thing. But I think you're still trying to address things in a more scientific manner yeah. than to say, take 20 supplements at once and I'll see you next year. Oh, buy the supplements from the lady at the front desk. It's $1,000 today for your half-price bill. Yeah, it's it's a frustrating thing uh, because the practitioners that I work with, they know that people get better on the supplements, but they don't always know exactly this is the one that did it. And right. I decided a long time ago that one of the cheapest things I could have was expensive pee. <laughs> In other words, I, I know that some of the supplements I'm taking might not right now be doing something, but I also know that you know, what I eat, what I breathe, whatever else I'm exposed to, the level of stress I'm under, that'll change. And having the raw material there probably isn't harmful. And if I can find research that says it is, then I'm probably not going to take that vitamin. So it it's one of those things that it is very individualized. And the the notion of biohacking, of using devices to track how we're doing. I'm an advisor to the HeartMath Institute. So I'm okay. Is heart rate variability a good measure for whether those supplements worked or not? Did it drop or did it go up? Because heart rate variability is a pretty neat short-term sign of the overall level of sympathetic nervous system stress. And I can tell you that my sympathetic stress goes way up when I'm exposed to toxins or when I'm having a hard time excreting them. It does for everyone. All I'm right, going gonna, so, gonna, to stop you on that okay. just, just, just for fun. If we look at exposures, we know... That if you, for some people affected by a moldy building or water damage building, and they go in, they start feeling bad, or even if they're not feel too, too bad, they leave quickly. We know that there is going to be, in a subset of those people, a significant rise of pulmonary artery pressure. And if you have a rise in pulmonary artery pressure, that means it's harder for blood to get from the right side of the heart to the lung, which means the blood coming back from the lung to the left side of the heart, which we call venous return, is going to be impacted. And if you are trying to do something like go up a flight of steps and you've got reduced venous return from an exposure or maybe from the, the winter pork that you ate two days ago, <laughs> what will happen is that if you don't control for PA pressure, you will have a problem maintaining cardiac output. So how do you increase cardiac output if you can't increase stroke volume because of venous return problems? You increase pulse rate. So if you're going to look at heart rate variability, which is looking at pulse changes, you've got to control for PA pressure. Now, you can use heart rate to determine a, a, basically a food sensitivity. So your heart rate goes up by 16 beats per minute or more on a regular basis. The key thing is that if we know you don't have a rise of pulmonary artery pressure with exercise, that's that's an important variable to put in before you look at heart rate variability. It all right. I'm going to have to bring my buddies from the Heart Math Institute on to talk about that because there's heart rate, but if you look at the change between the spacing of each heartbeat, you're getting a different signal there. So even if the overall rate heart rate goes up, if the sympathetic stress on the on the the organism is lower, the Interbeat variability will de will increase. So basically, the spacing between each heartbeat should vary regularly, even if you have a higher heart rate or a low heart rate. I, I knew we'd have a lot of good energy going today. <laughs> you know, sinus arrhythmia is part that, of, of life that everybody has. And so, once more, if we're going to try to to bring some science and and to to take your thoughts and your your feelings to the masses, we need to have good controls put in there. So good controls uh, is, is the basis of good science. Going back to the very important part of N equals 1 uh, being pretty primitive in, in how I've recorded data that was unusual in the past, 
I had a Ziploc bag that sat right in front of my chart rack, and I had sticky notes of people with unusual conditions. And when I saw two, I had two of them written on the same sticky note. And this was this was the the, the, the very sophisticated way that led <laughs> me to understand about gastroparesis being so common in people who have. Uh, chronic inflammatory response syndromes. We used to think that uh, GI function uh, that was diminished, it was confined with stomach contractility, thinking as their model, to older diabetics with bad control. It turns out about 10% of mold patients will have elements of gastroparesis. But it was just one after another of these sticky notes in my Ziploc bag that led me to say, hey, wait a minute, let's look at this systematically. That was a collection of N equals one. Yeah. Well, the the cloud computing stuff that I've spent most of my career working on has changed the N equals one game. So we can now do things things like Cure Together, which is a website where people do this, and some other ones that, that I'm actually actively working to support now, where we we look at, okay, who are people who have some similar observations here? And then we can organize little tests. Before, we would have relied on you to to notice this on your post-it notes. And now, it, it's something where it, between Google and between all the other things we can do, we can even coordinate things like, uh, oh, let's all look at our 23andMe genetic profile analysis and see what's common between that. And there's uh, groups want, doing this. You want to look at the genomics from proteogenomics because that's so, so much better, but that's down the road. Yeah. You know, there was a comment the other night, uh, I think it was during the, uh, the, the news, a fellow from Google, I think it was, was saying that Google is going to revolutionize revolutions and the internet, <laughs> the, the internet will, will take down governments before anything else will. And if this cloud technology you're talking about, coordination communication is focused on, you know, a million people from Australia all the way around to South Africa, there's no end to the data that can't be collected. And if the data is collected, somebody's going to have the computer savvy to mine that data. And that's, that's where the world's going to be. It won't be people with my Ziploc bag in the, in the, in the sticky notes. I'm excited about the changes that, that come from that. Now, there, there's a couple more questions that I'd love to ask you. Uh, the first one, um, is there a case that says people should be eating food that contains uh, some amount of, of mold toxins in it? Like, are there potential benefits that, that we know about or don't know about? Uh, interesting question. I know full well that my incidence of people with low levels of VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, is way, way more if coming out of moly buildings than not. And the incidence of cancer in those people is way, way down. If we look at the anti-angiogenesis movement that Jonah Falkman from Children's in Boston kind of got started years ago, his insight looking at what stopped new blood vessel growth needed to feed tumors was almost like uh, discovery of penicillin with Alexander Fleming. He left open a Petri dish that had some epithelial cells in it. And it was Friday night, and he comes back on Monday, and all these epithelial cells are all ruffled and crinkled, and they're, they're dying. He goes, my God, look at this. In the middle, what was growing was a colony of Aspergillus fumigatus. Of course, one of the nasties. And, and, and fumigillin was the first anti-angiogenic anti agent that there was. Now, compare that to the possible benefit and reduction of angiogenesis to aflatoxin, which is reported to be associated with liver cancer, especially in China and everywhere else. Well, if you look at the microcystin literature, guess where you find liver cancer increase with exposure? It's China and Australia. So are we looking at one variable of aflatoxin Another variable, it was microcystin, or is there some sort of interaction between the two? These are the things that, that I really want to know more about. In, in the meantime, my conclusion is that for people who are interested in being very high performing, there is no reason to intentionally eat even low levels of mold toxins. And a, a very substantial number of people experience improvements, particularly cognitively, when they avoid them, which is why I test for them in my products the way I do. And uh, I've even developed some proprietary testing protocols. Um, partly, yeah, I'm a canary. And so I'm more sensitive and I can feel stuff. But when I replicate that with lab testing and then 
I make those products, people who aren't canaries are like, wow, like I had a, a different kind of day because I avoided these things. So that that's kind of the, the root of, of the work I'm doing in large part because I really like to feel good all the time. So the stuff that makes me feel good all the time that I can replicate and make repeatable seems to make other people do the same thing. And there's a lot more science uh, that I'm really interested in, in funding on this. The passion that I'm seeing in you and the desire to, to make things happen um, it, to me is that that's, that's an indispensable element that must be there. Uh, I hope that you can find the, the funding you need and, and, and some colleagues to, to join along with you uh, in your quest. Uh, this does not sound quixotic at all. It doesn't sound crazy at all. Uh, it's, it sounds like you have a chance to bring your insights to, uh, to a far bigger population. My concern is that uh, I'm a bit embarrassed with that my profession, uh, that being a, a licensed physician, uh, includes a lot of people that don't like to read, that don't want to think outside the box. And as such, physicians are, are even slower than politicians to, to learn things, and certainly the attorneys are quicker along the way. So as you go forward in, in, in your quest, uh, always challenge you know, your, own, your own thoughts, your own hypotheses from today. Challenge those tomorrow. And that's part of my bulletproof yeah. world is, is to is to say, did this assumption that I made actually bear out? And yes. Another bulletproof idea is to uh, the key to understanding. Thank you, Aldous Huxley, is casting out false knowledge. Yes. Uh, here, here you got twenty three and me is is fighting with the FDA. They haven't done anything as far as their stuff since uh, December, thanks to a federal agency. And if if they're right. Good. Do the get get the data put out, but it it is just a stumbling block because until they can pass agency review, uh, people are going to throw rocks at them. So, yeah, and, and it, it's right. it's a reality. I, I get some rocks, and the the cool thing is is there are there are certain things you can do where it's painfully obvious that it worked. Like, oh, I lost ten pounds in a week, and I had the best week of my life. At that point there are a few regulatory agencies in the world that are going to stop people from wanting to do more of what makes them you know, feel much better. Sure. And, and so if, if you can't feel it working, then it's probably not as good as it could be. Well, we're, we're out of time, but there's one question I've asked every guest on the show. And that question is, what are your top three pieces of advice for people who want to perform better? This doesn't have to be just from your work as a physician, but your entire life's lessons, three most important pieces of sage knowledge for us. The most important one comes from the Greeks, and that's be true to yourself. The being true to yourself means that you're honest, means you're thorough, you look at things with, with rigor. Uh, the second piece uh, that I have to remember, since uh, I tend to, to say too much, is the tongue is the enemy of the neck. And by all means, recognize who your audience is, what, what your audience is, is, is going to be saying and thinking, and then recognizing as well is that if we really want to look at any kind of social situation, you need to look to see where the energy is. Uh, for some people, it's sex. For some people, it's aggression. For some people, it's money. Some people, it's power. Uh, in your case, I, I see the tremendous driver being knowledge. And as, as that, I will just go back to the Aldous Huxley quote, is that as you refine your knowledge and as you continue to cast out false knowledge, then when you have the understanding, then you're ready to go forward. And people can throw all the rocks they want, but your understanding will take the day and win it. Wow, that's awesome. Dr. Shoemaker, thank you a ton for being on the show today. It's, it's an honor to get to talk to you in person uh, because your writing has literally helped me understand some things about what's going on in the gut, what's going on with inflammation. Uh, that has not just helped me, but it's helped the people that, uh, that I've worked with, um, the people, some of the writing I've done uh, where people have read that and been helped. So your knowledge is, is definitely spreading. And where should people go other than to buy your books, uh, Mold Warriors and Surviving Mold uh, on Amazon or somewhere? Do you have a website that they should go to? survivingmold.com is just filling up with really nifty things to look at we're bringing in writings from multiple other practitioners and providers there's a lot of remediation um, 
that's 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 a good place to go. There's an awful lot of free downloads. Uh, frequently asked questions are are important. People should really know what their visual contrast sensitivity test is and what that of their kids is. Uh, you can do that. It's a few bucks, uh, but uh, wait, we it's, it's worth looking at. We didn't talk about that, but let's do that. Another day. It, well, it's, it's out of order. If you have uh, 30 seconds to explain what a VCS test is, it was on my list of questions. I just forgot to ask it to you. If we look at the reduction of blood flow into certain organs, we can measure using MR spectroscopy rising lactate in the brain. But how can we measure the so-called capillary hypoperfusion elsewhere in the body? And we can measure directly velocity of flow in blood vessels in the retina and the neural rim of the optic nerve head and reduction of flow will create a neurologic deficit in a function of vision that impacts what's called contrast and that's the ability to see a gray image against a gray background if you think for a minute of a white image and a white background if you're driving along on a sunny day in florida where everything is made of coral and this nice blonde lady with her uh, white shirt gets out of her white convertible are you going to be able to see her of white on white if you're a fighter pilot are you going to be able to see the mig coming out of you with the gray gray on gray Contrast vision is one element of our neurologic function of vision that's affected dramatically and rapidly by capillary hypoperfusion coming inflammatory responses. We can measure it, record it, use it as a monitor to show improvement with therapy. Also, it will show relapse if there is re-exposure, but it also will show us stability if there's no exposure and treatment has been obtained. So the translation of that for people who are listening, this is a biohacking technology by looking at the test that Dr. Shoemaker has created and seeing if you can differentiate between fine shades of gray, you can tell something about the state of your brain that you otherwise wouldn't be able to tell. It's pretty cool. I've used it myself. You know, I, I, I never, never have thought about that as biohacking but you're you're exactly right and thank you for that it, it was was worthwhile talking to you not just to meet you but to learn about vcs as a biohacking device that's cool thanks dr shoemaker have an awesome day okay man keep in touch bye-bye i'm a bulletproof babe and, and we totally and didn't need that t-shirt you need the bulletproof babe t-shirt oh my god i'm taking a note on marketing i'm taking yes. a note on that one um, Thank you. So pe people, people really should know that like we don't sit ahead of time going, ooh, let's talk no, about talk each about other's products. No. See the head of foam that's formed on it? This is similar to what you get with a latte.